Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am just another tinfoil hat. Welcome to my show. Today, we are going to be picking up right where we left off um, last time in our discussion of the mysterious airship of 1896-97. So, in my last episode, I covered the beginning of the flap, um, which primarily occurred in California in the later half of 1896. Today, we're going to delve into the rest, and by the rest, I mean the flap that occurred in 1897 and took up a huge portion of the United States. So the airship was definitely back in business, or maybe it never really went out of business. Just as the mystery left California in January of 1897, mysterious lights were appearing in the Delaware skies, and this continued over Nebraska and Can Kansas through February and into March, um, when the nationwide flap really started gaining speed, um, eventually would climax um, in April. So one of the first sightings of note was in late March over Omaha. A good-sized crowd gathered on a street corner to watch a large light fly over the town at a low altitude. And then, no joke here, on April 1st, the whole of Everest, Kansas, observed an object fly under the cloud cover, sweeping the ground with a powerful light. This object changed from a low speed to an incredibly high speed, swept low over the ground and back up again, and then hovered in a stationary position for about five minutes and illuminating a low cloud. Apparently its silhouette was clearly visible. April 12th was host to two separate landings in Illinois. Near Nilwood, three men witnessed a cigar-shaped object with a dome land. Uh, before they could reach it, it rose slowly and left, headed north. Later that day, a group of people observed an object land near Green Ridge. A railroad operator, Paul McCramer, claimed to have been close enough to see a man emerge from the craft, which he described as ship-like, with a roof and double canopy to repair machinery. Um, again, the object departed, headed north. Two days later, on the 14th, Gas City, Indiana was host to an object landing on the property of John Roosh, causing both his horses and cattle to stampede. Again, we have occupants, no less than six this time, emerging to make repairs. I swear these airships, whoever invented them, he invented a lemon, because these things are always breaking down. Um, also on the 14th, near Cleveland, Ohio, two men were fishing when they saw what they took to be a large boat with a canopy. On the deck was a man wearing a hunting jacket and cap, and nearby there was a woman and child. The man was fishing. Suddenly, a colored balloon rose from the object, which then took off into the sky, circling like a hawk before flying off. So the 14th was a busy day for these guys. You also have the account of James McKenzie of Castown, Ohio, who heard what he thought was a flock of geese passing overhead. He looked up and saw what appeared to be a huge bird, complete with wings and a tail or rudder of some sort. Suddenly, Mackenzie heard distant music coming from the object, which, as it moved out of sight, he then heard a human voice. Then he saw this large white thing fall from the craft. On later searches for the object, they couldn't turn it up. Throughout this portion of the flap, the really interesting thing is you have tons of different items being spotted in the sky. Much like the earlier sightings in California, there are anomalous lights of different sorts, balls of fire, dimly lit objects with lights attached to them, Lots of sightings that look like boats. I mean, the giant bird of James Mackenzie. Um, the list really goes on and on. Voices and music issue for many of these crap, um, items do as well. However, what really stands out about the sightings of 1897 are the sightings of occupants and the contact made with them. April 15th, Lynn Grove, Iowa. Many citizens observed a large object moving slowly northward, and so a group decided to follow it, hoping it was going to land. And would you look at that, it actually did. It landed about four miles outside of town. However, when the posse got within 700 yards of it, the craft unveiled four wings and flew away. And as if that wasn't enough of a how-do-you-do, the two occupants observed inside, who apparently had the longest beards any of the men had seen in their lives, threw out two boulders of unknown composition. Now, in contrast to the previous story, you also have accounts where the airship pilots are downright hospitable even offering tours of their miracle machines, though I'm pretty sure there's not a gift shop involved. Judge Byrne of Arkansas in late April reported finding an object anchored to an open space in a thicket. Three men showed him through the ship, and he was even able to discuss its composition and means of propulsion. It was some sort of aluminum and gas monstrosity. And then in between Lancaster and Baltimore, Ohio, sometime in mid-April, um, a prominent citizen who wished to remain anonymous found two men inside a landed craft. One of the gents appeared to be Asian, the other British. Now, in this case, there was no free tour. However, there was a complimentary demonstration of the ship's, sorry, the Airbark, as it was christened by one of the occupants, the Airbark's electrical lighting system. 
as well as the rudder and propeller before they took off into the sky. And then in Springfield, Illinois, April 15th, two farmhands apparently spoke to the occupants of an airship that landed outside of town to repair electrical apparatus again. Um, the occupants, two men and a woman, made note that they would report to the government when Cuba was free. Odd, considering the previous offer made to the Cuban government one airship for 10 million um, from the California leg of these sightings. Hot Springs, Arkansas, May 6th. A constable and a deputy sheriff noticed a bright light in the sky, which then vanished. They continued on their way and then saw it near the ground before it disappeared behind a hill. Now, at this point, they rode another about half mile before their horses refused to go any further. So then they continued on foot, and about 100 yards away from where they were, they saw two men moving with lights. So one of these guys moved forward, and it was a man with a long beard. And he informed the lawmen that he and his two companions, a young man and then a woman, were traveling in the airship. Visible in the background is a cigar-shaped object about 60 feet long. And as it was raining out, the young man was filling a container with water. And the woman actually stayed back in the dark underneath an umbrella. Now, the bearded man offered to take the gents someplace it did not rain. To which, apparently, John Sumter, one of the guys involved, signed an affidavit saying that he preferred to get wet. So the two men left, and then upon returning 40 minutes later, they saw nothing. Um, no takeoff, no landing traces, just absolutely nothing. So again, these cases of contact with seemingly human occupants abound. You can find great catalogs of them in um, Valet's Passport to Magonia, as well as Keel's Operation Trojan Horse. Um, now there's so much, just so very much from this. So before we move into the trickier issue of artifacts from airship and other sightings that were occurring in the area, I'll end this particular video with one of the most widely circulated airship stories around. That of Alexander Hamilton's cow. And of course I don't mean that, Alexander Hamilton. Just a certain guy by that name who lived and farmed near Vernon, Kansas. Sometime in the middle of April 1897, Hamilton was awakened by a noise from his cattle. Um, he went outside with two men and claimed that he saw a cigar-shaped object swoop low over his farm. He described the craft as a very large cigar shape with a glass carriage underneath, which was brilliantly lit. And inside this carriage, he saw six strange beings speaking some sort of jabbering language, the likes of which he had never heard. So upon noticing being noticed, the pilots, or occupants, or whatever you want to call them, switched on some power, and the ship rose to an altitude of 300 feet and paused over one of the cattle which was caught in the fence. So Hamilton and his um, two other guys went to help the animal and found a red cable slipped on it around its neck. One end was leading up into the craft, and the cow was had entangled itself in the fence, probably trying to get away. So they tried to cut the cable, tried to free the cow, but they couldn't, so all they could do was cut the fence and watch as the ship and the cow rose slowly into the air and disappeared. Well, needless to say, Hamilton couldn't exactly sleep that night. Um, that Tuesday, he began searching for the lost cow, and he didn't need to search long. Another farmer found it, or parts of it. Apparently, this other farmer found the hide, legs, and head in his field, and was only slightly bothered by the fact that there were absolutely no tracks around it in the soft earth kind of harkens to future cattle mutilations. So there's one other very interesting thing to note in this case. Um, Hamilton was deeply disturbed by what he'd experienced, and stating that every time he fell asleep, he not only saw the ship, but also the, as he described them rather vaguely, hideous people, whether angels or demons, he didn't know um, in his mind when he slept. He finally closed out his account by stating that he doesn't want any more to do with them. Um, I guess, for what it's worth, I hope he got his wish. While on the topic of Hamilton's cow, there is another very, very interesting piece to this already very interesting puzzle. And this is the fact that, as was pointed out by George Eberhardt in his article, The Ohio Airship Story, in Pursuit Magazine, Volume 10, Number 1, airships and occupants and bright lights in the sky, oh my, these were not the only things being reported in these areas at the time. But more on that next time. So in the meantime, you can check out my podcast on the Paranormal UK Radio Network, um, also called Just Another Tinfoil Hat, new episodes every other Monday, and old episodes available on Podbean. Um, if you want to keep up with whatever else I've got going on, please check out my website, which is, if you can believe it, also called JustAnotherTinfoilHat.com. In the meantime, I am Zelia Edgar. 
signing off. Do we?